Welcome in week three. Today we are going to focus on fairness. Throughout the course so far you've learned quite a lot about creating and validating methods that can be later used for personal selection purposes. In this case we are going to focus more closely on procedures of personal selection and also we're going to focus on outcomes of personal selection procedures. Thus, the agenda for this week is to discuss test bias and test fairness, also discuss procedures related to fairness in personal selection, clearing model, and also finally adverse impact in relation to Bertram's table. Last part of uh, today's lecture would be about a trade-off between diversity and validity in the workplace. It's important be be, uh, because in many cases it's important to have representatives of different groups of people, let's say females and males, uh, people with different ethnicity background, in order to build up diversity in the workplace. Okay. Let's move on. In part one, we are going to focus on general aspects related to fairness. When we discuss fairness, we need to consider two problems in general. First, test bias and test unfairness. Do you think that test bias is the same construct, the same thing as test unfairness? Let's take a look at differences between both constructs. Test bias is in general a psychometric problem. It can manifest as a difference in predictive validity in two or more groups. Let's consider this example. We have test score and Based on the test score, we want to predict suicide risk. We can predict the suicide risk in different age groups, in uh, people older, elderly, younger, in youth, and also people in middle age. As you see here, in these three groups, we have some differences. In group of old and young, we have the same shape of regression line. In both cases, regression coefficient, the beta in this case, is the same for old and for young. But for people in middle age is completely different, which gives a completely different prediction in this specific group. So this kind of bias can be assessed in a moderated multiple regression analysis where we test relationship between two variables test score and and criterion let's say if uh, beta for middle group would be 13 in other groups would be 0.45 that probably will uh, give us substantial differences between those groups in terms of prediction. The same case, the same example we could create for other types of group, not only for age groups, but also for differences between females and males or for different uh, ethnicity groups. Test fairness, on the other hand, is not a psychometric problem. It's a sociopolitical problem. Most often it's related to uh, how we process uh, test information. It's not related to the test itself. So it's related to what test, let's say, produces. It can occur when a procedure of test application uh, is not standardized or uh, a test application deviates from the standard. So it gives you skewed outcomes in terms of differences between groups 
Let's consider those examples. Later, we are going to discuss those examples in the Q&A session. First example involves a woman. A woman with obesity applied to Boost Group for a junior position. Boost Group provides marketing activities for manufacturers, supermarkets for instance. Boost Group rejects uh, her as a candidate because she has XL size of her clothes and the company uh, has clothing sets in size M and L. Is it fair? Do you see any discrimination here? Okay, let's move on to a second example. In this case, it's a different situation. A woman is Muslim and expresses religious beliefs wearing a headscarf. She sends an application to work in jail. She is invited for a phone interview. On the phone, she is asked whether she is willing to take off her headscarf. The reason why they ask her is that there are some specific rules in the institution. It's not allowed to wear any hats or any visible jewelry or visible piercing, and it's not allowed to show tattoos. That's jail, so they are pretty strict, right? The woman does not declare to take off her scarf. After the interview, she claims that she's, um, she was or she is unfairly rejected. Isn't it fair to see a discrimination here? Why? Okay, and last example. A big insurance company wants to hire new trainees. The number of job applicants is much larger than the number of positions within the company. The company decides to implement a selection procedure containing different selection rounds to screen the candidates as thoroughly as possible. Despite the good intentions of the company, it appears that after the last round, the selection rate of the minority group is lower than uh, of the majority group. Is it fair? that there are differences between minority and majority groups selected for this job? Do you see any discrimination here? Let's consider that during Q&A session. Now, I would like to focus on brief definitions of discrimination. On one hand, we have direct discrimination. So candidate rejection is uh, based on the follow following characteristics, like for instance, religious beliefs, other types of beliefs, political conviction, race, sex, nationality, sexual preference, marital status, disability, chronic illness, age, and of course we could add a few more. Do you think that some of the categories can be added here? What well, that can be? On the other hand, we have indirect discrimination. It's a specific requirement or a method that seems initially neutral, but leads to discrimination. Of course, this problem of discrimination is more complex. We are not going to discuss that in detail, but still, it's really important for you to remember that it's an issue during a personal selection. And of course, it's a different situation when we discuss overall group differences, and then when we consider cases. So, situation of specific people. We are not lawyers or we are not studying law, so let's focus on psychological aspects of fairness or unfairness. First of all, when unfairness occurs. Let's take a look at one of the examples of selection procedure. We open a job position, we advertise it, and then we wait for job application. Typically, people send us a CV and we do the screening. Some people are rejected at this point and some people go to the next round. Then, typically, we organize interview. Some people are selected for other uh, elements of the procedure. For instance, we can apply cognitive capacity tests. Some people are not invited. Some people are rejected. Some people um, got um, job offer. Let's focus on this part, on CV screening. 
This method, of course, is really very often used because we can learn work experience, education, and many other things that can be important for selecting specific candidates. On the other hand, we can also find information about sex, age, nationality, and also ethnicity based on, for instance, name. A few years ago, there was a study where they compared outcomes depending on whether a candidate had a name that was of uh, Dutch, typical Dutch, uh, or it was uh, um, uh, more Arabic. Um, for instance, Kies and Abdul. What happened? Overall, there were 360 applications. There were 180 applications with Arabic name and 180 typical Dutch names. As you see here, at this point, we see some differences depending on whether candidates were accepted or rejected. Overall, 60 candidates were accepted. 300 candidates were rejected. Let's take a look closely at the differences between types of names. So we see a difference uh, between Arabic and Dutch names. 14 versus 46. So less candidates in the first group with the Arabic names were selected for specific job than mm, typical Dutch names. We can also depict these differences here. So regarding the percentage, so seven point, around 7.8 um, candidates from the uh, with the Arabic names were selected, whereas 20 around 26 percent of candidates holding a Dutch name were uh, selected for a specific job. In this case, since we see differences between uh, who, depending on name, is selected, maybe we can suggest that candidates should apply anonymously, so without uh, disclosing name, first or the last name. Do you think that makes sense? Let's move on. When we consider fairness, we can ask a question, what can be fair? According to Arvor in Runs, we can consider procedures as being fair or unfair, or we can consider outcomes as fair or unfair. They suggest that specific information could not or should not be used. So, for instance, given the fact that we can obtain substantial differences between groups that re may represent minority, minorities and majorities, we should avoid uh, not. Uh, we should avoid disclosing age, sex, religion, civil status, or political sympathies. They are not job related. So, what's the point to ask for name? Also, we should not ask about private stuff, like sexual orientation, willingness to uh, get pregnant. Also, we should not, uh, not ask about questions that can be easily faked, that cannot be uh, tested. So, for instance, different types of preferences, because candidates may easily adjust uh, their responses to what it's actually or what can be expected. Uh, for specific job. Outdoors, they suggest that procedures or measures, tests that should be used should be merit-based, should measure capacities, experience that can be uh, job-related. And of course, work-related aspects, um, personality characteristics that can be important for specific job. Let's take a look at an example from one of the most popular stores, uh, grocery stores in Netherlands, Albert Heijn. Let's take a look what um, this uh, job form requires. So if you would like to uh, find a job in Albert Heijn, uh, it's pretty old form, so maybe nowadays they do not ask all those questions, but uh, still uh, it's, a, uh, uh, it's a true example. So first of all, um, um, they ask about job position, uh, whether a person like to work full-time or part-time, but also they ask about first name, 
voornaam, achternaam, so the last name, gender, and other stuff. Also, they ask about nationality or the uh, country of birth. Do you think that makes sense for a specific job? As you see here, some items are not work-related and should not be asked. Age, nationality, sex. Some of those, for instance sex or age, can be asked later on. I think it's possible. Doesn't make sense. Okay, let's move on. Let's assume that the procedure of CV screening can be biased, the same interview process, where you have a specific interaction between people. Now, I would like to focus on this part, on part where methods like cognitive capacity tests can be used, and later on, specific decision is made, whether a candidate is accepted or not. Let's focus on outcomes. In this case, what is really important to think how we can prevent specific mistakes when we accept and reject candidates. Because on one hand, we may have a group of candidates that are accepted even though they perform later on poorly um, doing a job. On the other hand, we may reject candidates that can perform job well, but based on test, they've been rejected. So we can consider two types of groups, wrongly accepted and also wrongly rejected. Of course, that always happens. We, uh, during the pre selection procedure, we may do both things. Cleary model helps us to understand the problem of wrongly accepted and wrongly rejected candidates. It also shows what can be relationship between selection for a specific job depending on majority and minority. We see that, we will see that in a second. Let's consider this situation. It's pretty simple. We have a test score and we know based on previous data that the correlation between test score and work performance is positive. Let's say effect size is 0.5, so pretty high. We assume that if candidates score on average as the limit of the predictor, let's say um, some they obtain some score, and if other candidates score are higher than the limit of the predictor, they are also hired, they are accepted for, for a job. If they score lower than the limit of the predictor, they are not accepted. We do that because we expect, as you can see based on this graph, that since the relationship is positive, then we expect that the higher the value on a test score, the higher would be work performance. But what we can also observe when setting some standards for job is that some of the candidates, they may not perform over a specific limit. Because typically, at the job, we expect that people, they do well. We do not want to have people who underperform. Thus, we can set that there is a specific conceptual limit of the criterion. Thus, overall, when process of, process of personal selection and measure um, of work performance is finished, then we can encounter four types of groups. First of all, we have a group A. It's a group of quickly accepted candidates. We have group B. It's a group of incorrectly accepted. So as you see, they perform very well on a test score, but later on, they underperform uh, in the workplace. So we consider them as incorrectly accepted. Fourth group, sorry, third group, uh, correctly rejected, it's a group of candidates that were rejected because they didn't score above specific limit. And that's, of course, assumption because uh, the correctly rejected group is 
uh, never tested in the workplace, but we assume that probably this group would also underperform uh, in the workplace. But there's also another group that is not tested in the workplace, so we do not test, we have no clue how they would perform. Um, but we assume that this group exists, um, so this group, group T, uh, is rejected, but it can be considered as incorrectly rejected. They may be under, uh, perform under um, limit of a predictor, but if we would hire them, then maybe they would perform very well uh, to the same level as the correctly accepted. Again, this group is never known. As you see here, we select specific test. This test gives us an estimation of specific trait and also creates a prediction of the future uh, work performance. Let's say if validity of this test is 0.5, that's pretty nice because quite adequately we can assess numbers of candidates in group A, but also we can nicely assess um, numbers of candidates in group B. Let's consider another situation and compare that to the previous one. Let's assume that we do not use any test. We just perform random selection. We just, let's say, throw a coin and select candidates randomly. That would be this situation. So if we would apply random selection, all groups would be equal in size. So the same size for correctly accepted, the same size for incorrectly accepted, correctly rejected, incorrectly rejected. Do you think that this method makes sense? When we can use random selection? When this method can be applied? When does it make sense? Okay, let's move on. Okay, now situation becomes more complex because besides situation where we create prediction for uh, work performance, we can also consider differences between groups, majority and minority. As you can see, based on this graph, there are two types of differences between both groups. On average, majority group scored higher on the test score than the minority group. On the other hand, both groups also scored differently on the work performance, on a criterion. There are differences between both groups. But what they have in common is that for both groups, we have the same prediction, so the same shape of the regression line. So if on average this test score would be, as you see here, that would be an average for the majority group. And then here would be an average for minority group. They are different. But also, there is a difference between both groups on the criterion. On the other hand, prediction for both groups is the same. So the effect size or the regre better regression for both groups is the same. Okay, let's move on. In this situation, we have slightly different shapes of the regression lines. First of all, what you can see is that in the majority group, this regression line is steeper than in the minority group. So in both cases, we have different regression lines. As you probably remember, that indicates a bias. Since in this case, we consider outcomes as well, 
we can conclude that it's a situation that shows lack of fairness as well. Because we may observe systematic differences between both groups. Let's say here we have an average for minority. So if, let's say, the score on a test, here we have 0, here we have 1. So if on average in minority group they score 1, then the work performance is here is 0. Let's say it can be minus 1. But when you consider the same value for the test score, then we have completely different estimation for majority group. Let's say 5. As you see, in this condition, we have completely different prediction of um, work performance for both groups. They think that we should use the test score or we should not use it. Let's consider another example. In this case, again, we can observe differences between majority and minority. But there are also some similarities. Let's focus first on the similarities. Here we have prediction for both groups. So the shape of those regression line is the same in both groups. Let's say in both cases effect size it's positive and let's say it's 0.5. So if we take into account value of Here's an average value for minority, average val value for the majority, and then let's say overall this score zero. Here we have minus one, here we have one. So there are no differences um, on the average. But again, we observe differences In the prediction of work performance. So the same score for both groups gives again different uh, prediction of work performance. The cause of this difference are basically differences on the criterion. The procedure of estimating work performance is biased and thus leads to unfairness for the both groups. In this case, minority underperforms, so performs lower than the majority. Let's ask a question. Can we conclude that the test score in minority group is either overestimated or maybe it's underestimated? What do you think? Okay, let's move on to the final slide. In this situation, it's again a situation where we have same prediction. That's a prediction for this group, for the minority, and that's a prediction for the majority. So the shape of the regression line are the same. So the effect size can be similar, but there are other aspects that are more important than the shape of the uh, regression line. Let's say, again, we have zero. On average, value of the test score in the minority, it's, let's say, minus two. On average, and that's a systematic difference, in a majority group, it's plus 5. So as you see, it's a huge difference. But on the other hand, the value of minus 2 gives average prediction of 0, 
in the minority, but the value of 5 gives the same. So it means that participants or candidates in a majority group, they need to have test score of 5 in order to predict the same value as we would predict with way lower value in the uh, minority group. So, if you consider, let's say, this group of majority group is, okay, it's plus two. So that gives lowest value. So let's say minus five. But this value is not relevant for the minority group because they obtain highly different estimation on the work performance, on the criterion. So again, let's ask a question. Test score in minority group is overestimated or maybe it's underestimated? Let's discuss, discuss it in a Q&A session. And finally, the same as for the all other questions, you can ask this. Use the test score or not. What do you think?